All right. Well, welcome both Greg and Colonel Bill Edwards. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for, for coming on the show today. We've known each other for, for a little while, going back and forth on a few things. So I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah. It, it, and Brian and Greg, thanks for having me. It's, just, it's, it's always, always great to see old friends, uh, especially in this type of environment where we can talk about some substantive topics and, and um, hopefully you know, have some impact on, on people and, and what they're reading and what they're seeing and what's going on. So and it's always, it's always good having uh, that opportunity when we're not surrounded by lawyers in the same room, Bill, where we can speak <laughs> frankly and freely on our own. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so we'll, you know, just kind of jump right into it. I know our listeners got a little bit of an intro, but you know, basically you, you wrote this book uh, called Inside Abu Ghraib and you know, it's well, memoirs of two U.S. military intelligence officers. So you and, and your, your you know, basic commanding officer that you're with, but um, I kind of want to just let you jump right in because there's everyone's likely heard of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal and everything that happened there, or at least can, can instantly, you know, a, a image comes to mind when you hear Abu Ghraib, certainly from the images that came out of that prison, but there's actually that prison was on Abu Ghraib, which Abu Ghraib was also an operating base, which was in a key area right outside of Baghdad, Sunni Triangle on the road to Ramadi and Fallujah. So like it was this small, again, what happened in, in Iraq was like this small little area that had massive, massive operational and strategic influence in the area. And so you got sent in there. So I kind of want to let you start the story of, of how this happened and everything that was going on there. Yeah, no, great. Well, again, th thanks. Thanks for letting me, let me talk about the book. Well, the book was the, the book was an idea I had um, really in about in 2019. I was I was eating I was eating dinner in London with a friend of mine, a British friend of mine. We were at the Royal Automobile Club because he's a member. Believe me, that was a fantastic event. But um, he, he said he, he said, Bill, you know, tell me tell me some uh, stories from your army career. And I said, I don't I don't really have any stories. Um, and he's like, no, no. You know, I, so I, I got into this this uh, story with him about Abu Ghraib. And uh, he said, you have to write a book. And I said, I don't know how, I don't know how to write a book. So we, uh, he uh, connected me to a really dear friend of his, who's a, a prominent British author. And he's, he's our co co-author on this book. His name's Paul Zanin. And Paul got Bob Walters and I um, really off the ground on how to put this book together. And, and really what the book is about is it's about it's about our unit. It's about the 165th Military Intelligence Battalion. We were a, a tactical exploitation battalion, which was long range surveillance and human collection teams. And so we were had a specific mission. Um, we were sitting in Balad, which is north of Baghdad after uh, the major combat operations had completed. And and the the really we thought we were going home. You know, we thought, you know, we were about 90 days in, 100 days in, and, you know, everything was calm. And then sometime in late August, early September, uh, we were uh, shocked into this reality of the IED. Um, and we actually had um, a soldier in our brigade that was killed on MSR Tampa with one of the first IEDs. So it changed the entire dynamics of the conflict. We were told we were going to stay for a year. Um, so we started settling in, conducting operations, just like we would do in any disciplined organization. And so that that's sort of the stage setter. But, you know, as the book um, came to life, we wanted to tell the story from our perspective. Um, we also wanted to include our families and our children in the book as well, which is to me is really the most powerful part of this book. And frankly, it's the people that have read it have told me that this is the story that they never hear, right? They never, they think it's a, it's a book about a military operation, which it is in some respects, but it's also about the, what our families, the price our families pay and what the service gets from our families while we're deployed from a support perspective. So I think that's really important. Um, so that's kind of the stage setter of how we got the book off the ground. We started writing it in uh, January our February of 2020, and we finished it uh, first week of October of 2020 after um, many, many trials and tribulations of going back and forth and trying to get it right. Um, and then shortly after that, it went to publication in, in November. 
didn't release uh, in print until November, uh, really Veterans Day of 21. And that's when um, uh, the story was told. Now, one of the interesting things I'll, I'll comment on real quick is that I think we're probably the only ones that wrote a book about Abu Ghraib who were actually there. So we <laughs> right. we are we got there. something to say about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we're telling the story from our perspective. Right. Obviously, there are many stories, and we all know this was a a, a moral a moral issue, a moral blunder um, in many respects, a strategic a strategic blunder as well. But we can get into that if you have questions. So hopefully yeah. that sets the stage, Brian. And, and, yeah. and I would say just for everybody that, that's listening in. You know, we're talking with <laughs> Colonel Bill Edwards and, and, and William Edwards has done a, an amazing amount of stuff in his career. And this is one piece of that entire career. And we're lucky enough to know him and be able to ask him a couple of questions. What I found most compelling about reading your book, and, and I know there was a lot of love and a lot of other people that are in it. What I think was best is, first of all, it is a true memoir. It's a page turner. There's little mini vignettes all around there about different things that every soldier can relate to. Yeah. There's not a, a soldier or a serviceman that's ever been deployed that won't find themselves at some point in this book looking Go in on. the rear view I, window. I've, or, seen or, that before, I've or, been yeah, there. Yeah, I felt yeah. that. And what I also love is that you're two thirds into the book before you get to the point where the disc is dropped. And now we're talking about uh, uh, things that happened to Abu Ghraib that gave everybody a black eye that, that lasted for a good long time. So, the, the relevance to me is that I'm not sitting here reading some kind of expose or finger pointer about all these other things. You know, this was a, hey, listen, this is part of a huge deployment that we had in coming home and doing the rap. And this thing happened right about here. And this is how we dealt with that thing. And, and I think, Brian, what I liked about the way Bill and his team put it together, I think that in that first two thirds, all the stress fractures, like you yeah. kind of were ambushed in, in a way, and there, there's a great chapter about an ambush as well near the beginning, but you were kind of ambushed in a way because nobody warned you about the, the thin ice at Abu Ghraib before you got there. And so, you know, you, you skinned your knees. It was a learning environment. You figured out what was going on. And then even during some of the uh, horrendous things that, that, that were uncovered, you and your unit had nothing to do with that. But what you didn't do is you didn't turn a blind eye and you didn't try to walk away and and you you saw those things and you went in and you tried to fix it so i felt really good all through the book look bad things happen and they happen and are exposed during wartime and then we spent years trying to get people to understand how those occurred your book does it in in yeah. fast fashion you you get right to the point and and was that your intent how did you how did you get like take me through the process of having this wonderful memoir and all of these experiences and now all of a sudden, warts and all, you're going to discuss Abu Ghraib. How did that come up? That couldn't have come up in, at dinner in London, Bill. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it was it was on our it was on our minds. Um, you know, we we got home um, from that deployment. This was OIF one, so we were in. You know, and, and Brian might have been in in the same place. Or I was as late. As well. okay, I, I, I got out there not far from where you're at in Ramadi and oh, for OIF two. So it would right. Been right after so I mean, but morning. we were, yeah. we were sharing the same dirt. And so mm -hmm. that's what, that's what I tell people all the time. We we're regardless, we were sharing the same dirt at some point, but the, the, that was a really contested area um, of, of Iraq during that time period. And, you know, it was significant. It was a significant emotional event for us. Right. And we were, like I said, we were, I hopefully tried to paint it earlier, but we were sitting in Balad thinking, oh, we're ready to go home. Let's go. This is done. We're done with this. This is over. Let's transition it to uh department of state or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know let's do something different. And, um, and we, I got this call from a friend of mine and it's in the book. And he, and he says, Hey, Bill, uh, uh, you guys, you got to move the battalion. And I said, I go, what do we got? Why do we got to move the battalion? He said, I, I need you to move it to Abu Ghraib and fix it. And and I said, I said to Mickey, he's in the book, Mickey Williams. I yeah. said, Mickey, fix it is not a military order. <laughs> you have to give me task and purpose. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he said, Bill, I don't have time to argue with you. <laughs> go to Abu Ghraib and fix Abu Ghraib. So less than 12 hours later, and Greg, getting to your point, we were rolling down MSR Tampa with a leader's right. reconnaissance. And then we're on that on that uh, installation, and it, it took takes about an hour, hour and a half to get down there. I think, if I remember correctly, 
and we we roll in there and what we see is incredibly disturbing to us we're a we're a disciplined organization our commander who's who's my partner in this book bob walters was a fantastic leader he set conditions in every aspect and basically he commanded the unit and we ran it you know we we ran it as the the xo and the ops officers and the company commanders and the first sergeants and the senior ncos blah 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 all the way down the line but you know bob commanded that organization and he set those conditions and so when we got down there the first thing we did um was start setting discipline standards and accountability the minute we walked on there and and i happened to be uh riding or the sergeant major of the battalion was riding with me in my in my truck in the truck i was in and i thought he was going to lose his mind when he when he got out of the the vehicle and just saw all the all the issues of discipline and things that weren't happening so for us it was a, to answer your question long story long here greg is it was a significant emotional event for us to go down right. there and then see that now what i tell the story about and you know and 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 i talk about a guy named romeo koreshi and we talk about mike flinty and other younger officers that were significant enablers of helping us do that but that day we spent all day down there we gathered our thoughts i left romeo on abu Ghraib, and i said i'll be back in five days with the battalion because i was the xo of the battalion i said i'll be back in five days with the battalion i need you to have infrastructure set up for me and this was one captain by himself and he was utilizing uh iraqi contractors that kind of followed us around uh, that worked for us. And when we got down there five days later, we had infrastructure set up and, you know, he had done a fantastic job. I, I still, I still talk to him to this day and, and, uh, I still give him credit. I tell his wife all the time, you don't know how great your husband is. <laughs> That's great. No. And, and the, the book does a really good job of, of painting that picture, right. Of, of what, what you kind of walked into there and and again you know for anyone listening it wasn't your unit was not it had nothing to do with the actual prison on the compound and 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 did, did those detainees or interrogating or any of that process you weren't really part of um at that level but you were overall part of this base that was there and you you're integral to that and just showing up you know the description you give is, uh, you know, the physical condition of the camp and the way things were when you got there. I'm reading that going like, wow, this was a, I mean, you want to talk about a catastrophic breakdown in, in order and discipline of what you need, because, you know, you know, good order and discipline I don't, is, isn't just, isn't about, you know, haircuts and things like that. It's literally like how you are, the way you're living in your camp says a lot about you. And it's almost a similar one. We had to do a rip out with the unit. And it's not that they had broken down with their, with their, you know, good order and discipline, but you could tell the feeling of the camp, the way things were and how things were getting a little dilapidated. And it was only because they had lost so many people and they were constantly fighting. They also didn't have a lot of time to upkeep stuff. But I just remember that same feeling walking in or like, even just as a young, you know, Lance Corbett being like, man, this is not good. What's going on here is, is this is not good. This needs to change. And we had to do that. But, but seeing that it bleeds over into everything that you do. So it was almost like I'm reading this going, I only know about the prison part and the interrogation, all the photos that came out. And then you read about what was going on in that entire camp to me. I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's why those things happen. It, it starts when, when that st sort of discipline starts to go, when that good order, you know, starts to go away, like it, it, it affects literally everything. It affects the physical environment you're in. You can see that on someone where they're not taking care of themselves. You're not taking care of your camp when you're not taking ownership of those things. I mean, it just leads to that catastrophic failure. I could feel that in that book, right? I mean, I don't know if you had no, that. No, no, that's of... exactly Listen, we just came from a, a head shed with a bunch of uh, 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 training where we do tabletops with some very critical thinkers. And I always throw out Lord of the Flies because you can start seeing that breakdown. And the, w w w wherever you come in on the book, when you assign somebody, hey, take a look at Lord of the Flies, take a look at the real story, and you tell me what happened. And, and I'll tell you, Brian, I think you hit on something. It's, it's being involved in kinetic combat and seeing death after death after death. And those, those uh, uh, personnel that are coming in and trading out, 
they weren't embedded with your unit, they didn't do the work up and do the train up for the unit, and then all of a sudden those stress fractures start to manifest. And if command doesn't see those, and, and you know the old the, the the old quote that you use, Brian, uh, uh, that that which you walk past is the standard that you end up accepting. Uh, the, you know, you come in on that full well. I I can only see it from the sergeant major's viewpoint on that, and and you come in and you're you're like, where do we start? And and that's that's the great question because you do address that, but how do you how do you not eat that pizza all at once? How do you break it down and actually uh, instrumentally influence change in an organization that's gone that far off uh, off center? Yeah, I, so we we had to do we had to do exactly that. So we had to come in that that day we were on Abu Ghraib, that first day we did the leaders recon. We yeah. were really getting ourselves together. We were getting organized, and we took. We took the senior leadership of the battalion down there. I mean, it, and you normally don't do that. You normally don't take, you know, especially on on uh, trips like that, which are fairly dangerous at the time, you know, the the team. But we had to do that. We had to assess the the environment, and we had to come up with a game plan. Leaving Captain Qureshi on the FOB was step one, right? To do that. Um, when we went back to Balad, I had literally four or five days to get the entire unit for over four hundred people together with equipment and moved um, down down there so we could start setting up operations. And when we got down there, day one, we were running ops. I mean, we right. just literally picked up from Balad. We were doing um, we were doing LERS patrolling that night. We were doing everything that we would have done in Balad or any other location we were in. We were executing the mission. And basically for us, it was it was almost like a battle drill, right? We just said, okay, um, our missions change. We have change of mission. We're, we're going to go down to this place. We're going to establish ourselves and we're going to take charge because we've been given the authority to do so. So when we actually rolled on there, we took control of all the, all the security and the outer perimeter security. And then we basically, I think what was even more important was people that were there saw a good unit come in and right. they were like, all right, we got to square ourselves away now. You know, and so it makes and a that's lot of how, sense. And and we, you know, we leveraged. I mean, look, I I I am a huge fan after serving in the military for so long, of the of the non commissioned officer corps, right? And I will tell you that we had the best non commissioned officers in that battalion that I would want to be with in combat at any time or in any situation. But they just knew what to do inherently. And they started fixing things. So, and you know this, I, I mean, most people know this as an officer in a, in a unit, uh, I was the executive officer in this unit. Um, my job, you know, I was, I was provide, I was supporting the commander's intent and the NCOs were executing the commander's intent. So we, we were just, you know, and I hate to, I mean, I'm not, it's not in, uh, talking i'm not making any of this up we were just a good organization right. and i think it was a smart move to to move us there now professionally the unit grew while we were there we got better when we were there and and that was a testament again to to the people yeah the and, and and i i just want to make sure you know that we have a lot of listeners that are uh, le uh, law enforcement first responders fire professionals a lot of former soldiers a lot of current military folks we also have captains of industry and people in all walks of life. So, folks, when he is talking about moving a battalion, even an hour and a half away, what you're talking yeah. about is you're talking about accounting for every single person that that is, uh, you have some people that are on sick leave. You have some people that are on vacation, some people that are adjunct to other units. You're talking about every piece of serialized gear, every weapon, every NVG, every nod, everything. You're talking about every bed and billeting option that was a possibility. And you're checking out. It's like checking out of a, a hotel from hell with all of these different things and making sure that all your books are returned to the library. So we're talking about a huge major operation now that you survived that in in five days is a testament to the strength of the organization and sometimes we say strength and i think what i'm hearing you say is health i'm hearing you say that you had a healthy battalion full of resilient ncos which made that lifting and pushing so much easier is that a fair uh, assessment yeah absolutely absolutely i think resilience is a great way to a resiliency is a great way to to say it you know uh, but every everything um, at least in my opinion, starts with um, attitude um, and how how you view 
you know, we could all, you know, sit on our, we could have all sat around and said, you know, this is going to be horrible. What are we, why are we doing this and complain about it? But right. really the attitude was like, let's take it on. Let's go do it. Let's go, let's go fix this, whatever we got to fix. We didn't even know what it was. Let's go fix it. And, but that comes from, that comes from the top. It comes from the commander. It comes from the senior off. It comes from the sergeant major, comes from the NCOs. And they just tell the soldiers, hey, look, we got another job to do. We got a mission. Let's go. You know, we're going to do it. We're going to we're going to take care of this. And, you know, it was literally and I'm not going to lie to you guys. It was literally the worst place I've ever been in my life. It was horrific. And and I I, I say that, I think, in the book. But I want to emphasize that right. I've been a lot of places. Yeah, I mean, this was absolutely the worst place. And we just. We just made it the best we could. And, and we have a lot of funny kind of funny stories around it as well. You know, trying to get um, one of the things I may talk about, I don't remember if I do in the book or not, is trying to get satellite TV into the tactical operations center so that we could, you know, put on an NFL game at some point. Because we hadn't had we hadn't had like a TV connection in months. And, and, right. and so, you know, we're going through all these things. The other thing I'll mention is that this specific location was mortared and rocketed every single day multiple times a day it was not a nice place and um and so you know throw all those things into the into the mix and you know we had our hands full but i just i just remember you know i i smile to myself sometimes thinking about the people uh sometimes thinking about what we went through and and then, of course, wanting to see all of them and capture and, and be with them again because right. it was such a it was such a great ex experience, even though it was horrific. And then, of course, um, uh, talking to our wives and, and children about what they were doing because you know, again, at the same time, soldiers in our people in our unit were getting wounded. Some we we did lose some people, um, and our wives were on the on the end of of helping us in the, what we called in the support area or the rear, right. Helping us with the, the all the family support issues and things that happen in that respect as well. And, so, and, and just a really, really interesting time. And they were going through, you know, they had a lot going on as well. And that the book does a, a, a good job of yes. that. And, and, you know, you know, we're talking about how you had a unit that was just, okay, you guys are good order and discipline, right? You're, you're resilient unit. Everyone's, we got everyone on the same page. And I, I feel like, you know, the simple, the simple sort of commander's intent basically is what all you got was the fix it. That sort of becomes, you know, sort of the mantra for everyone at the unit. Then it's like, you're clearly going into a situation that needs to be fixed. Cause you just mentioned like, Hey, you had these NCOs that just stood up and it's like, they inherently knew what had to be done because they know if something's broken and if all you're saying is fix it, great. You're not telling them, you're not, you're sort of allowing them to do it on their own, which, which is, that only happens if you have that, that good, healthy unit, meaning whatever organization we go to, I mean, cause we do this in the private sector as well. And exactly. they're like, well, what do we need to learn? We need to go over this. And we're like, we pull off all their little manuals and everything they got. And we're like, Hey, you got really good stuff in here. And they're like, where'd you find that? We're like on your shelf. Uh, exactly. you, just, you just haven't just trained, the your, dust off you haven't of trained your people and, and given them the, the sort of the, you know, the, the, the competence and the confidence to make their own decisions. Like, you know, most places where you go, you can go around and just ask the people that work there, what the problems are. And they'll know because they're the ones dealing with it every day. And so if you sort of let them do that, and there was sort of one story, I don't want to get it wrong, but like uh, one story highlighted in there about the significance of Abu Ghraib too, is you had, I mean, someone walk up, to the base and give some very, very uh, important information uh, regarding the location of some people that were very, very high value into targets that you're looking at. Do, can you can you kind of give that story a little bit? Because it kind of goes to show like how things work at, at a low level if someone's sort of empowered. Yeah, I mean, look, that that um, that was that was a strength. Again, I go, you know, I go back. I talk about this a lot after after being retired now for several years and working in private sector and business, um, and trying to get my head around, you know, equating, you know, the two military service and then you know transitioning to business. And really, everything is about people, right? And what and if it it we lead, you know, I think the Marine Corps has a great saying, and I'll have to give the credit to Marine Corps. We manage things, but we lead people. 
That's a yep. Marine Corps thing. Yep. And I, I say that to myself all the time. And when you give that um, that ability to have initiative and to be innovative and to be creative and you inculcate that into the culture of your organization, you will see great things happen. And I think that's what was happening in this organization at the time. Um, you know, the, the, uh, we experienced a lot of things on Abu Ghraib. I mean, there, we, uh, frankly, I've probably forgotten. I mean, we probably yeah. didn't even cover everything in the book that was, was hap- going on there. And, um, you know, so we had all of these instances where soldiers and NCOs and young officers were were doing things, taking the initiative themselves and doing. I'll, I'll give you a great example. The infrastructure on Abu Ghraib was horrific. We had we had no services. We had nothing. It was like living in a, a true field environment. And the the first day we're on the FOB, you know, one of the senior NCOs in the unit, uh, Sergeant First Class Bob Wells. He he's he says we got to get after infrastructure. We got to start building this place up so we can stay healthy. Because he was, they were really, we were really worried about just being sick, yeah. you know, and getting sick on this in this mm-hmm. environment. Not to mention all the medical waste that was coming out of the ground. I mean, literally, we had to give an order that soldiers could not wear flip flops or flimsy types of shoes outside of any sort of hard structure because. We didn't know what was coming out of the ground at that place. It was just uh, some of the things it was it was just things we had to take take care of. And and people understood why, you know, why we wanted to to give that that direction um, so that they they could uh, stay safe that way. But those are the type of things that were happening. Um, I think the incident you might be referring to was Ude Kuse. Is that yeah. is that the one you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. So that that walk in was actually up uh up north it wasn't at abu Ghraib. okay it was actually yeah, I got at, that. um yeah it was actually it was our unit i yeah. mean it was the folks from our unit they were operating with i believe the 101st at the time and um that walk-in came in uh to them there so yeah. that was that was an interesting event but i think i think that's um i think that's something that's pretty well known at this point on what <laughs> what happened after that oh yeah yeah for sure they walked in and i know it's someone in your unit and then the guy's like hey i think you're looking for these two guys and they're on my street and that was yeah uday and kuse hussein which you know it goes to show you like you know some that though that that street walk-in right if if handled properly you know that's you never know what that's going to lead to i mean no yeah it, it, i think you the know, point you're, i think the point you're making though is yeah. is that those people were in our organization and they were decentralized from yep. us so they were not connected to us, but they were still doing the right thing. Precisely. So, you know, this goes back to the point of, you know, do you do the right thing when someone isn't watching, right? That's uh, something my my dad used to tell me all the time was, you know, do the right thing when someone really isn't watching. And then, you know, that's a that's a true testament of, of, of you know, if you've got it right or not. And I think that was, was what we're talking about here is, you know, these these guys were living with a whole different organization, functioning under a whole different culture and organization, and we're still doing their their job, still doing their mission correctly. So one of the one of the things, Bill, we talk about when we go to a unit, and uh, uh, we'll talk about whether whether it's a battlefield to boardroom, whether it's a battlefield unit or a boardroom unit. When when we drop in on there, we do what's called a CTA, a cognitive task analysis. And we like to look at what they already have. What are the underpinnings? What's the infrastructure they have? Brian alluded to that earlier. And many times we say, we're not going to be able to, to teach anything new, but we will be able to create an efficiency uh, uh, in this line of communication that, that you're, you're weaker in, and this is what's causing most of your drain. So most people do that right. Uh, uh, and most educators understand hegemony and, and pedagogy and why that's that's critical to the structure. Most of them don't understand that there's also an andragogy, which is, you know, the pedagogy is teaching the kids so they'll pr- proliferate. Andragogy is going in and teaching the adults because the adults are actually the ones that still are in control of those old folklorish things that make the, you know, the shadows dance in the cave. So when we go in, we talk about knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSAs, but we've added over time aptitude and attitudes to that. What, what folks that are listening right now, what, what Bill is talking about and Brian's talking about is literally addressing the attitudes. Because even though people have the ability to carry something out and they have the aptitude to fix what's broken, their attitude may be a lingering malaise 
which causes them to delay or look the other way or not answer the call. Somebody's always going to look at it and say, it's not my job. It's somebody else's job. That was broken before I, I got here. What I loved about your book, your book was a mea culpa of sorts. Hey, I'm the guy that's in that chair now. It's not going to go past my desk without me touching it. And, and I think that even in, in education and specifically in training that we do, the book is a great testament how you uh, did your own OODA loop on lessons learned and fix what was broken in stride. So if, if you understand that long-winded uh, approach into what I was trying to say, Bill, uh, would you agree with that? And, and would you agree that you also epitomize that uh, uh, with the stories out of Abu Ghraib? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with it. I think, um, I think what we found at Abu Ghraib was it was, I call it leading through adversity, right? So we knew we were going to be in an adverse, adverse situation and we didn't, we, we, we didn't, sit back and say, this is not our job. No, it was our job. We were given that job and we went down there and, and that's what we did. We took it head on. And, uh, but it, you know, it starts with, le it always starts with leadership, right? Yep. And so one of the, the basic problems of the organization before us was that leadership failed, right? I mean, that, that, that's a, that's what happened. Leadership failed. And then it was at that point, there was no control at that point, right? There was no, mm. there was no way to, to keep the unit focused. We had a, a strong, a strong uh, sense of pride in, in what we did as an organization. Again, you know, those are things that were built over time. And look, I, I joined the organization in, er, in uh, after the unit had deployed into OIF one, right? I joined, I was at CGSC. I was in school and they pulled us, pulled us aside and said, Hey, you've got to go to these units now. And, you know, you're going to take over these specific leadership roles. And when I rolled into that organization, I think I might have told the story in the book, but they, uh, I'm sitting at BIOP. I had flown in from Rhein Main Air Base and, and um, uh, the, uh, you know, I called up to the unit somehow. I found the phone number. I don't know how I found the phone number. It was some crazy way to do it. But anyway, because it's a tactical phone, you know how it is. Right. Anyway, I call, I find the unit and they say, yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll send a LURS, LURS team down to pick you up, um, you know, in a few hours, et cetera, et cetera. So the, my first encounter with this organization was with junior NCOs who came to get me to bring me to the organization and every single one of them, it just made me smile, you know, just made me smile to say, I'm going to a great unit. Uh, the story I think I tell is, you know, we, we flew over, we flew over without a weapon. So we went over to the, to, uh, in country because we did, the weapons were all in country, you know, the, the rifles and the pistols and things. And one of the, one of the junior NCOs walks up to me and he says, he says, Hey, sir, you don't have a, you don't have a weapon. <laughs> oh no and so he he hands me his nine mil and some ammunition and he says hey take carry this as we go up uh, msr tampa back to balad i'll jump on the 50 cal and um so it was just it was almost just like it it, it didn't even phase him he's like here's my weapon you're good to go now i'm gonna take this position and now we're rolling and that's it yeah you know so to me that was the organization and that was my first encounter with the organization and I was extremely happy at that point. Yeah. People extremely don't happy. understand. And, yeah. and this is one of the things you bring back to industry. High functioning units uh, 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 are, are efficient and they have an efficacy about them that you feel. You can actually sense it walking into a building or into a room that it's not these hollow epithets that they hang, you know, the, 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 the statements on the wall. They embody those principles. And I love that. That, that air of confidence uh, and competence comes across but it's not bravado. Uh, uh, so that's wonderful that you got well, to feel that immediately. The, the, the other part, the other part of that story that's really funny is, is when he's handed me the, uh, the pistol to carry, he said, he asked me, you, you do know how to use it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was... <laughs> and, and, and he, and he was just, he was just joking around with me, but he had never right. met me and I'm, I'm a major in the army. I'm going to be yeah. his battalion executive officer, but he had the confidence to just to, to kind of joke around. I think, you know, and say, and I looked at him and I said, well, I hope so. I hope I, I hope <laughs> I can, you know, and what happened on that trip back was, and I think we tell it in the book is we were, we were ambushed on MSR Tampa right. going back to the unit. So I'm in country less than three hours or four hours or whatever. And we're already in a, in a, in a small firefight on the highway. 
And, and frankly, every single one of those guys that was leading me back to the unit, they had their battle drills down. They knew exactly what they were doing. And it was, it was like, uh, you know, uh, just taking care of business. That's, That's incredible. Great. No, I love that. And, and so, you know, we, we see that too, because everyone talks about, well, you know, in the, in the military, you know, you, you, you've got this, you got trained and everyone's on the same page or so it's like, yeah, but no, like you still need to have that strong leadership. Like you could have, you know, it, you know, my opinion is you could, if you have the greatest team ever put together, um, if they don't have a really good leader, they're, they're, they'll do okay. They'll still do well, but they're never going to see their full potential. But if you have like a, an average team of just a bunch of people thrown together, you know, maybe never worked before, but you have really good leader who can articulate what they want, what they need. People will, people will accomplish more than you could possibly imagine. And, you know, you've got these different examples because now you do a lot of stuff with, with, you know, private sector and you've been uh, with a bunch of different companies, both as consulting and as directly working with them. Um, you've introduced us some, some amazing people as well. And so yeah, I always ask people kind of like, cause to us, the, you know, Greg, you know, mentioned the battlefield the boardroom and it's like a tagline we use but the way we approach it it's the same problems right the same issues you're going to rise yes you know in this might be about you know your bottom line versus people getting killed the consequences are, are different right but but the problems themselves are similar so I'm, I'm curious how you take that approach to like the private sector stuff that you do what translates well what doesn't what issues do you see because we get those questions a lot and people go well yep. yeah but that's military and it's structured that way it's like no, but it's still about people. It's still it's still about those people first. So I'm curious as what you see coming from, you know, think about you going into Abu Ghraib to fix it to you going into a company that's going, hey, here's our issues. I mean, what, there's got to be so many similarities and and uh, that you see. Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. Um, I run into it all the time. Um, it, it, it comes down to two things, I think. One, people uh in organizations and businesses they need they need to see themselves right so you have to see yourself and culturally you need to see culturally what your organ how your organization functions and how so when you transition from the military especially in leadership roles your role changes in private sector you know you're you you do have authority um accountability and responsibility as a leader in the military but you may not have that in private sector directly but you do from a leadership position or a leadership role, and then how you articulate that in an organization um, that is not structured like the military is to be aware of who you are, to see yourself as a company, as an organization, as a, as a department, whatever it may be, and then to understand how you function from a cultural perspective, and then what is your true vision for your business and your and your the mission of your business. So what are you trying to accomplish in private sector? A business is put together for a specific reason. The company I'm working with now, we're a software as a service. So we have to rely on our product has to be a good product that functions and meets the needs of our clients in order for us to do well as a company. But then culturally inside of our company, how are we going from articulating what our product can do and what it does all the way through the cycle of implementing it, right? Putting it into practice, putting it into play, but then getting the rewards uh, culturally inside. So everyone feels like they're part of the team, like they've done something that's going to that's going to do uh, provide a security service, right? For a specific client, or it's going to provide safety for the public because that's what our SaaS is about. Our software is about security and safety. So I'm just talking from my personal experience and perspective, but in every business understanding, it's always about seeing yourself first and then understanding the culture you're working in and then bringing it all together so that you can then have success. A lot of people, you know, people are different, right? They, they want to have, um, maybe individual uh, success. But I always talk about the difference between morale and esprit de corps. So morale is individual, esprit de corps, esprit de corps is team. Esprit de corps will always make your individual morale better <laughs> if you have good esprit de yep. corps. So if you can focus on the team idea, everyone benefits from it. Because here's why. Morale, like look, morale changes by the minute, by the yeah. hour, by the yeah. second. 
if I if I trip over something walking to the kitchen and I scrape my knee, like Greg alluded to earlier, I'm going to be a little upset. It's going to, you know, it's going to change my morale. But if I have a great esprit de corps environment, my team's going to pick me up. Someone's going to say, hey, Bill, you're going to be all right. It's OK. Go get a drink of water, you know, take some take some aspirin or something, whatever it may be. And then I've already forgotten about what happened and my morale is back to where it was. That's why I talk about the difference between esprit de corps and morale. And that's a simple explanation, but you can apply that in right. business. You can apply that in the military. You can apply it almost anywhere. So. Yeah, and if anybody was listening, I hope they're taking notes of that too, yeah. because the idea is we, we constantly drive home to everybody. Culture is context. Why is that important? Because culture becomes a lens with which you can uh, conduct predictive analytics. You can take a look and project where likely stress fractures will occur in an organization, how a organization will do when they meet an outside influence, what outside uh, uh, stressors or uh, agitation will uh, work to our benefit and work to our detriment. Because what happens is when you're in a, a, an organization, as much as your individual accomplishments are key, it, it's the intellectual uh, acumen that's regarded collectively that defines your organization. And so you can see that in the individual, but it's, it's, it's a magnification of the larger. And therefore, you know, we do nothing but predictive analysis. And so we go in and, and, and somebody says, fix the broken organization. Sometimes we don't need to fix anything. Sometimes we just need to shine the light on where the knowledge resides. And once the people go, aha, that was our, you know, that was the center of focus. That's where we, we went off track. Then they can backtrack on their own and fix it. So I love that you can take that uh, uh, from the military to the corporate. Because, folks, don't, don't, don't get us wrong. Uh, uh, they're all vets on the call and thanks, everybody, for their service. But at the same time, the military doesn't have everything right. There, there's still mistakes. They still learn. Yeah. And there's still boobs that go off the reservation and do something stupid. But the idea is if, if you look at the structure, the structure has lasted uh, uh, for this long through so many challenges because the structure is sound. And when the military finds out that the structure doesn't work, they update it, fix it, or abandon that strategy. That's different somehow uh, uh, and sometimes with business world rather than military. I think you both I just, would agree yeah, I, with that. Yeah, I, I, I want to make a great points, by the way. Um, one thing I think in, in, in Abu Ghraib, which was clearly evident in the 165th, our unit was we were responsible and accountable. And we knew that at that point, when we were given the mission, we became responsible and accountable. What I tell you, you know, younger officers and NCOs is that you can never delegate responsibility. You can never delegate. It. It's, it's not something that's dealt. I'm not delegating you responsibility. I'm telling you that this is our mission. We still own it. And so we have, and that's, what's going to happen. Accountability. You can, you can delegate accountability. If you think about property or you think about, you know, things that have to be accounted for by someone else. But when it comes down to responsibility, it is something that you cannot delegate. And second, I think, you know, I, I talk a lot about flexibility versus agility. And in organizations, I think you really need to look at the definition of agility and why agility is so important in an organization. Agility gives you a lot more than flexibility does. At Abu Ghraib, we were agile. We, we had to change with the environment every single day um, that we were there. And it was, you know, one of those lessons learned when I was still fairly young in the military, because this, this happened when I was a major, right? I was, I still went on and served another 10 or 12 years and, and, mm -hmm. and actually deployed uh, back to Iraq as a battalion commander in, in 2010. So I took all those lessons I had learned and then applied them to my battalion and tried to tried to function as best that I could in, in another stressful environment where we were um, transitioning out brigades and then starting to to change operations in Iraq from OIF to New Dawn. So, you know, all of these things have been pretty important concepts for me. So, you know, I talk like I said, responsibility, and accountability, and agility. Those are those are things I like to mention as well. And with tied to the Abu Ghraib. Um, lessons learned right no and and um you know you you guys both hit on a bunch of points and when that are 
a, a few things, right? When we drop into that private sector, again, people go, well, that's different because there's you know, military is this and you have an overall mission and, you know, we have this and sometimes it's, we have, you know, a sales team and they're motivated by obviously making more sales and sometimes they don't collaborate well and they're doing, and it's like, yeah, we, we get it. You know, that's why we always call it the, you know, the writing for the brand. It's like, okay, well, it, it's almost that, that version of a spirit of core. Like what, what are we doing here? What's our, what's our actual goal here? What's our mission? Where do you fit in? Because everyone, you know, when we talk to individual departments or individual agencies or people at an organization, they always go, well, you know, the problems are here. And we can't ever get this done over here. And it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, and it's that person's fault. Got it. And it's that other department's fault. Got it. And then you go to that department, like, oh, and it's that department. And it's just a simple, like, they're not communicating across a lot of the times um, or, or people aren't empowered to make those decisions. And, and so we try to boil things down to here's what your mission statement says. You know that saying, that quote you have at the front of your building when you walk in? This is what that means. And a lot of people just literally have that light bulb moment or going, oh, okay, like I, I see what you're saying. Now, no one ever explained it to us. You know, right. the, the, you know you, everyone, everyone's got the Notre Dame play like a champion today. Well, <laughs> they, they're actually taught what that means. You can't just put the quote right. on the wall and then hit the board as you go by. You have to know what that means to your role. And sometimes we just have that simple job of explaining where someone fits in with that, that to help support the overall mission. And, you know, you brought up the good one of seeing yourself, right? And all of these different ways to look at it. And, and you know, most people when put together and given a challenge, they're going to come together and want to defeat that challenge. It's, it's inherent in human nature that we kind of do that. And we do that really well. And so I think having that grounding is like, you know, we get focused on all of these different uh, uh, issues. And even, even within the military, even with that other organization we were talking about too, uh, before we get on the call, I don't want to name it on here, but you know, it comes down to those values. And, and if I relegate my values to some online oh did you read it did you check the box okay got it like you know uh, or that's part of the hr processing or hiring process here yeah you had to fill this stuff out and you sign said this is the core values of the company it's like if that's the actually that's the bedrock of everything that you're doing here right it, it, it really is in a lot of cases and if i don't get really good training of what those values are for our organization I, I actually won't make informed decisions. I could be really good at my job, but it might be counter. I might be doing something that's counterintuitive or or uh, goes in you know in, in the opposite direction of where we're paddling here, and that's where you cause those issues. And and I think if you focus on those things, on on what it means to operate in a company or a team or this environment, what our actual values are, and what that mission statement plastered on the wall means you can figure out the rest of the stuff. You don't need all the little answers. You'll, you'll figure that out when the time comes. And I, it's just something kind of like, as uh, both of you were talking about it, I'm going like, yeah, these are the same things we see everywhere. Uh, Brian, and I think to, to, to capitulate, listen, the difference, I think one big difference about the, the military is remember, it's a volunteer military, yeah. but you're obligated to finish the mission. You're obligated to the fellow soldiers and the Marines that are around you. You have to do this because if you let that line go slack, somebody's gonna die. And, and I don't think that corporate America understands that that's the value of hiring a veteran in there is because that veteran will never uh, knowingly disgrace themselves or the name of the corporation. They will always give you 100% when they show up. Those are great values. And, and I would say this, and this is not a sales pitch. Everybody knows we're in 200 flipping episodes. We're not trying to sell shit. <laughs> I would tell you that Christmas is coming up yeah. and get this book because this book is a conversation starter on those conversations you didn't even know you haven't had yet with your family, uh, with your coworkers, with your friends. If I was a copper, I would definitely get this as an FTO and I would share little vignettes out of it uh, each time that we were out on patrol. So I would look at it because you've got a, 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 an incredibly long, wonderful, illustrious career, and you're doing stuff now that I like to follow. When, I, when I'm on LinkedIn, the, the whole time that I'm sending a thumbs up or a, a light bulb moment or something like that, <laughs> Bill, is when you're talking about uh, uh, drones and how people get that information wrong and where that's going. So I take a giant evolutionary step back and say you need to read Abu Ghraib, and you need to see Bill's perspective on it because it'll open your eyes to how – uh, uh, organizations work and how they can fail and how that failure can stay in an organization for a good long time. But it also doesn't uh, uh, embody or epitomize your great body of work, Bill. It, you, you have, uh, uh, you've had stuff before it that you did. 
and this uh, uh, thing that you've done since then has defined you. And the book is just a collection of those great thoughts that anybody could use. So don't get it because it's about the Iraq war and don't get it because it's about that area west of Baghdad. Get it because it's a great story about people and how people can deal with other humans. I, I would, Brian, I just want to make sure that that comes through loud and clear that we're both huge fans of the book. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, I really I, appreciate that. Yeah, so I I kind of want to like ask you, you know, with everything that's in there, because again, there's the there's the stories so from much. family. Um, that are wild, especially, I think it was, um, uh, um, you know, not, not yours, but, uh, Colonel Walters, like family and daughter situation in the hospital in Germany. And you're just like, what in the F? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're knowingly giving her a lower standard of care because they're, they're pissed that the United States is in Iraq. And you're just you're like reading these incredible things that a family has to deal with while you're for deployed doing all this. And it just, it's, it's, uh, it's really it it shows both at like a tactical operational strategic level at at a global level at an individual level how these things affect everyone in so many different ways and and something that again uh, which is why we appreciate the book too is yep. you know i knew none of this about abu ghraib i didn't know all of this stuff and i i wasn't i've been around in that area i've spent a lot of time in the sunni triangle you know the, especially the the el ambar province there outside armani and everywhere around there it's like man you 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 had this significant event that is not defined or there's one thing that seems to define abu ghraib there was so much more to the so much more to it and so you know, I, out of everything that you kind of learned there, and then again, like Greg said, you had this, you, you retired as a colonel, uh, so you have a, a large career in the army, not just this one thing, this one uh, a deployment that you talk about in this book, but like, I'm sure you, there's so many other lessons learned in there. But the idea is like, what what is it that, that out of this experience at Abu Ghraib, like, is there something that is your overall takeaway? Like, I know everyone wants that. What's the drop on the tongue? What's the boil it down to one thing? And there never is. There never is. But there's usually something overall that carries you through in other experiences that you took away from that, that you can kind of point to and go, hey, this is one of the most important things I learned out of this experience. Yeah. So um, I, I think I think for the audience and then you know, for those that are in the military still that may may see this is is that we've we've really got to value um, the role our families play in in support of what we do when we're away. So, you know, interesting, my wife and I were driving the other day and we were trying to count how many years I spent away from the family during the career and then how many years I actually spent in training um, you know, and we came we came to the conclusion that of of close to a thirty year career, I was probably gone fifteen years of that, and then spent at least six of it in peer training. Um, so by the time by the time we went to Iraq and OIF one, we were a well oiled machine um, in the U.S. Army, and I know the Marine Corps is the same way, the Navy is the same way, uh, you know, the Air Force is the same way. All the services were very well trained. Um, but the families were also well trained at this point. You know, it, it, those those families that have have gone through all of all of these years of of um, service to because you know that it, it really is service in both aspects. The, the the army I always used to say gets two for one. They get me and they get my wife to to run the 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 family support groups and and those types of things with help with others, right? They never do it alone. But the things, you know, that were interesting to me, the, the takeaway is the strength of the family, right? And that's super important. I think we need to try to uh, do, a, do a, a stronger job or a stronger push of pushing how important that is and recognizing um, our support structures. Because if you're worried about something, Brian, and you know this, if you're downrange and you're worried about something at home, yep. your mind is not where it needs to be. And that goes for if you're in law enforcement yep. or if you're a firefighter or you're an EMT or whatever it may be, it's really important, um, I think, just to to support the what the family does for us. So number one. Number two, what came out of Abu Ghraib for me personally was my belief in in people, right? My belief in what people can do and what people are capable of doing. And, and all of those strengths that come when you're in, we have a chapter in the book called Embracing the Suck, 
Okay. Yeah. When you're embracing the suck together, those are memories that we will live with you forever. Those that's another strength is just recognizing people. Now, one of the things I took away from that was when I later commanded a battalion in Iraq, um, I was making decisions on critical missions for my unit based on people's strengths. Everyone has their own strength. We as leaders have to find what those strengths are and get people into positions where they can thrive. That's super important to me in private sector business, but it was in that time period in Iraq as well, that sec or that uh, time when I was in command. So my point is, is, you know, quick, quick story. Um, when we had crew systems finally come to theater, crew systems were these counter IED systems that were in our vehicles. Um, the, the smartest person in my battalion was a PFC, a private first class mm -hmm. who understood the crew systems better than anyone in the organization. And I made him the NCO in charge of crew systems. Now he came to me and he said, sir, you know, I'm a PFC. No one's going to listen to me. <laughs> I said, I said, you don't need to worry about that because you have now the authority yep. to quality control our crew systems and everyone clearly knows you're the expert and they don't want to go outside the fob unless their system's working. <laughs> Believe me, they're going to listen to you, brother. They're going to listen to you. Yeah, I mean. And so it was this idea of empowerment is what I'm talking about is, yep. is finding those, those places where we can empower our teammates to, to do great things. Not only is that good for the organization, but it's good for the person. And Absolutely. a lot of times I think people make quick decisions on, on people. And this is, I think, uh, immature leadership. They'll make quick decisions on people and then, and then that's it. You know, I've had someone tell me before I can make a decision on a person in 30 seconds. I think that is not true. I think that is not true because you don't have the time to actually see what their strengths are. So to answer your long story long, Brian, those are some of the things I took away from Abu Ghraib just as a, as a person, I was very shocked. Uh, I, I tell people all the time when my children and wife wrote uh, for the book, um, I had never seen what they had written until the book was published. Wow. And so when wow. I read it, I was in shock. <laughs> I, I could not, you know, because they didn't want to do it for one. They didn't want to be a part of the book, but we, I had to sort of coax them into doing it because it was a memory for them. They didn't want to relive. Yeah, is why they didn't, they didn't want to do it. And so, but they did it for me. And then when I read it, I was incredibly shocked, uh, especially when my, um, my daughter didn't, you know, she was old enough. My oldest daughter was old enough to understand when I was, when I was getting the combat action badge um, post deployment for, for the, for what we, what we had gone through and they read the citation and she didn't, she didn't know what it was all about. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. It's really it's incredible is. that you didn't hear that stuff until or didn't didn't read it or know it until until after it was printed. That's pretty powerful. Just and, reproves my point, Marin. This well, book has to come out in your family between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and it'll make a direct yeah, impact and, in the way how you think and how you talk to your loved ones. And and you know, well, that's it's not surprising that your answer boiled down to support structures. Exactly. And, and that's both at at a family level, at an organizational level, at at you know, as a leader, how to look at that. Personal level. You know, sure. mo, you know, most people, you just if they're trained to do their job, you usually just have to get the hell out of the way and let them do their job. You know what I mean? And and it give them the support that they need. And and you know, and you have people who are like, well, what if I do all this stuff for them and they turn out to be well they turn out to not be a good employer, not doing this. It's like, well, that'll be obvious right away. And, and then you, you can find someone that will. And, and that, that does not surprise me that, you know, we're, you, again, it goes back to, you can have the, the throw the best team in the world together. If they don't have the support to accomplish their mission, it's never going to happen. Uh, or if you can take sort of an average team, put them together or, or a mix, mix match group of people and you give them the support that they need you get out of their way and you give them clear direction. Like you, they will, again, like you said, they'll surprise you every time. I mean, every time, like I've been, people will rise to the occasion. If you, if you let them, if you give them the support yeah. they need. I, I think the last thing I, I would say about that is that is if you're in a leadership role, and this is just my opinion, you have to have energy. You have and, and you have to you have to um show that energy 
you know, it has to be out there that you are energetic about what you're doing. You, you're, you love what you're doing. You're in that position because, you know, you can make that difference and, and you can provide really leadership is about support. It's, it's right. really what it is. It's like you said, you know, um, I'll, I, Bob Walters was great. You know, our commander, he'd give us guidance, you know, he did it really succinctly a couple of bullet points and he'd say, all right, go, go take care of business. And so we were very, we were well-trained at doing that. And, um, he was never, you know, never micromanaging that process because he knew we were going to give it our best effort. And really what you can, all you really want as a leader is you want to count on people giving their best effort. And, and because at that point, you know, when, when you're a colonel, like when I tell people, and I, hopefully there's generals and colonels listening to this as well, but when you're at that level of leadership, you, you have to, you have to determine what is a challenge and what is a crisis in your organization. Yeah. You have to define challenge versus crisis. And if you define challenge and put and been basically 99% of everything you do is a challenge, you relieve the stress of your organization and you relieve your personal stress. If everything is a crisis, nothing is. We've all heard that. Yep. But the it. point is, is what is crisis and what is a challenge? And for me, again, you just made me think of something really great. Out of Abu Ghraib, I understood the difference between challenge and crisis. Yep. That's and amazing. That helped that me alone, as a leader. What a gem. What an amazing gem yeah. to walk away with. That's yeah. great. That's that's incredible. Well, I uh, I we really appreciate you coming on here talking about it. Um, there's so much more in this book that you know that yep. that you can read through and get these these great little insights. I mean, Greg said it right off the bat. Every chapter I read, there's something in there yep. where I went, "Oh, but yeah, dude, I get that." Or you know what, I've homely. seen that before. Yep. Or hey, man, that's that's pretty cool. That's kind of a similar reason why I, do. you know, what I mean, you, you see all that throughout there. And then of course the family side is always good to see because that's not a perspective I ever had, right? I've only had it from, I'm the one out there doing stuff and then family back at home. And you do really forget how much is, I mean, you, you do know, but like, until you sit down and read someone's, Hey, well, this is what I was going through during that time. I mean, just absolutely powerful. And you forget that, you know, too. I mean, it was still in the same way where I'm out traveling, doing stuff all the time. And I got to make sure the family's good at home. And that's a, that's a process. Like, and you have to learn how that works. And, and now that's like you said, there's just no difference than some law enforcement officer going out there dealing with the worst people, you know, that the city or County or state has, you know, they're the ones they have to deal with it every single day, day in, day out, and then come back home and trying to lead a normal life. It's like, well, there's, there's balance there, man. Like it's going to spill over. So, so having that process helps. So, Talking about all this stuff, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I definitely want to have you on again because your uh, uh, one of your areas of expertise also, uh, like we mentioned, is sort of this commercial drone use and the rise of it and how much it's changed. And and now, again, like we talked about at the beginning um, before we started recording is you know everything that's going on in Ukraine and coming out um, is, is revolutionized it sort of again. Um, I, I think a lot of people probably like you saw a lot of this coming, uh, but but we'd love to get you to on to, to talk about that. Um, so we do appreciate you coming on here, Bill. Yeah. Th thanks so much. I, I'll leave you with this. Um, the, the day after I got back from Abu Ghraib, I was in my apartment in Germany. This is literally 12 hours after we had gotten off the airplane and I went into the kitchen. My wife tells the story and I knew I didn't know where anything was at in the apartment because I never lived there. Yeah. I didn't know anything about like uh, where was the coffee, where were the cups, all the simple things that people take for granted. But I um, she tells the story where I got up and I made her a pot of coffee or a cup of coffee or something at the time. And she woke up and cried. Oh, uh, yeah, because she yep. hadn't had anyone help her for over a year. And she got up and there was coffee made something so, so I, simple I think, I think people listening you know don't take the small things for granted um you know listen to a guy i'm just I, i'm an expert in nothing but i have a lot of experience in some things and i'm just giving you that my lessons learned but that point of that of what she told that story was very powerful for me it's in the book um and i had no idea that it was so powerful for her so. And I, I would say, first of all, it's all the small things. Yep. Your life is a rich tapestry of small things, not major events. Th those will age with time, but those small things are what makes life livable. That's amazing. Great, great story. And thank you for sharing that. I know how emotional that must have been.
amazing. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on again. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll have you on again. And thanks everyone for listening in. Don't forget that training changes behavior.